Um, so I'm super excited to introduce Audrey. Um, many of you probably know um, Audrey um, and her work as a digital minister. I got um, to know the work when she um, showed up on the 50, we at a political, we run um, Agile 50 list in collaboration with the World Economic Forum and showed up as one of the most agile people, um, as did Sim in the world revolutionizing government. We have some others here, I'm sure, who would be candidates for that. So really appreciate the perspective, the freshness, the transparency that you bring. So Audrey, over to you. Thank you. Uh, and good local time, everyone. I'm uh, really happy to be here talking about digital social innovation. I think uh, the three pillars, fast, fair, and fun to work with the people, not for the people, uh, provides the answer to really the first question, what was our best uh, decision to do in digitalization? I would definitely say around 2016, when we classified digital public infrastructure as eligible for infrastructure money, period. Uh, and that, I think, uh, brought a renewed interest in pro-social social spaces on the digital realm, the digital equivalent of town halls and um, Hyde Park, right, uh, libraries, museums, and so on. So our citizens are not forced to use the digital equivalent of nightclubs with smoke-filled rooms, intoxicating drinks, private bouncers, Facebook, uh, for pub public conversations. And so, um, for example, uh, in 2019 December, when Dr. Li Wenliang, a young doctor from Wuhan, posted that there were seven SARS cases in the Huanan supermarket on PTT, the Taiwanese uh, social media, which is uh, free of advertisers and shareholders. That's the only place around the world that actually triaged and escalated the issue. So we started health inspections on the very next day. Uh, so that provided uh, the time model of countering the pandemic of no lockdown so far, and also the infodemic with no takedowns. And another thing is to invest really in the infrastructure of listening uh, with empathy at scale. So anyone can call this toll-free number 1922 to add to the collective and connective intelligence of counter-pandemic. Like last April when a young boy called 1922 saying, you're rationing out masks, which is great, but I got was pink ones, which is not great. All the boys in my class have navy blue medical grade mask. I don't want to wear pink to school, I'm a boy. Well, the very next day in the daily 2 p.m. press conference, all the medical officers were pink. Uh, the Minister Chen even said Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So the boy became the most hit boy in the class for only he has the color that heroes wear and the heroes hero wear. And this uh, iconic picture, this is a Creative Commons licensed, soon gets remixed into internet memes and so on. So pink mask became very fashionable for a while uh, last February and so uh, last April. So the mask rationing part, which I alluded to, again, this is a co-creation uh, with a decent centralized community called Gov Zero, but it's piggybacking on a centralized community, which is the government digital service, or our services that ends in something that gov.tw, they repurpose it to change the O to a zero, basically, with the same domain name, uh, so that just by changing one letter into a digit in the browser bar, you get into the shadow government that does the same thing, but better. So, for example, uh, last February, when we rationed out the mask, the real-time inventories in each pharmacy were displayed by more than 100 different visualizations tools so people don't have to clean in vain and there were no panic buying and come this May when Taiwan faced our real first wave the same bunch of people in Gov Zero forked our contact tracing check-in method and introduced this brilliant app free design in your lock screen on your phone you can just swipe point and then click send SMS, that's it. It sends a toll-free SMS to 1922. That finishes the check-in. So no app download required and so on. It's um, you know graceful fallback to even the flip phones because you can manually text the 15 uh, digits. And so this showed that with real-time open data or open API, each and every one person closest to the pain, be them a pharmacist or someone who work on public venues for contact tracing, can actually increase the bandwidth of the democracy by amplifying their social innovations using exactly the same access as the policy context and open data. Of course, it's not just for programmers, the artists and designers. As I mentioned, uh, the pink mask thing, it was actually the idea from participation offices, dedicated teams embedded within each ministry in charge of engaging the public. So the Minister of Health and Welfare Participation Officer who suggests the pink 
Panther uh, thing, uh, actually uh, lived with this companion dog. And they basically just take new picture of the dog whenever there's a rumor. And we use this idea of humor over rumor. So that's this internet memes like this dog saying, uh, wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand or explaining physical distance in terms of the Shiba Inus away from one another soon became much more popular than the conspiracy theories and so on, ensuring that people specializing in art, in design and so on, just as they could use the, you know, modeling of our presidential office uh, or our dictionary, our national dictionary of more than 20 different national languages or my own portraits or whatever, people can actually know just uh, the why of policymaking, the how of policymaking, the real-time context of policymaking and so on, instead of just the what of the policy. So uh, the idea I think is very simple. If people have assistive intelligence power, pro-social infrastructure that's worth investing in, then people actually do resonate with one another others' feelings. And uh, to answer the next question, uh, when we develop this process of V-Taiwan, I think the main shortcoming in hindsight is that we run this conversation uh, as an entirely social sector movement without involving professional public service. But when I became the digital minister in 2016, I discovered that actually the career public servants are the ones that are most innovative and they see this as really a safe and swift way to listen at scale. So uh, if I time travel back to 2015, when we realize that most people agree with most of each other on most of each other's positions, we would definitely um, open source everything, but let the career public service co-create this entire public infrastructure. Maybe then we will classify it as infrastructure investment a couple of years earlier. So that's my opening keynote. Fantastic. Thank you. I'd love um, for the folks listening to just write a few uh, if you have any questions, we have time for a question for, for Audrey, if you have any, or if you have a takeaway, something that really struck you um, about what Audrey said. Do we have, do we have any? Do you have claps coming, Audrey, obviously. Um, I was really struck by your use of fast, fair, and fun, and humor over rumor. Um, and I was also really struck by the fact that you said the public servants themselves were the most innovative. I, I know we often think when you hear the word bureaucrat, people are like, oh, but if you actually talk to people and give them space, the, the bureaucrats are quite, quite innovative. Great, any questions coming from the chat? If not, Audrey's gonna stay on the panel and we're just gonna roll right into the panel. Thank you very much, um, Audrey. And we'll come back to you um, as the, as the um, audience emerges with some thoughts and comments, super. So what a great way to start. We started off with listening to you. I was struck by um, uh, Audrey talking about the infrastructure for more, um, um, li for listening with more empathy empathy at scale. And that's what we wanted to do um, with you all at the beginning, sort of what is your position on centralization or not? Where is your government when it comes to digitalization, which is different than digitization, which is about thinking differently about how, how things work, which you can see um, Audrey has helped lead with others um, in Taiwan. Now we want to go to a broader um, conversation where we're going to bring in our, um, our other panelists. Um, but first, what I want to do is introduce um, Gerhard Hammersmith. Um, Gerhard, can you give a wave um, to everyone? Um, he's the director um, for the Center of Digital Governance here in my hometown now um, of Berlin at Hertie Germany. I know, um, Gerhard, you're going to give a, a quick overview um, of some of the findings um, that have come out of um, Tropico. So, Gerhard, over to you. Uh Thanks a lot, Lisa, and very warm welcome. It's really a great, great pleasure for me um, join, to, to also join this, um, this, this great event today, um, which somehow perfectly rounds off our tropical research over the last um, last um, three, four years. And one part of our tropical research, which I had the pleasure to coordinate, did focus on exactly the question we want to discuss today with you, how governments in Europe organize and achieve successful collaboration across government organizations in order to achieve digital transformation. I think Audrey very much emphasized this emphasis. I mean, a lot of innovation, a lot of capacity comes from government or from civil servants themselves. And we just need to organize or find ways to enable them and to to and yeah, to allow them to, to collaborate together. And this was exactly the focus of our, um, our research, but it also showed that this collaboration is not easy to achieve. I mean, we've looked at central government projects aiming to build up um, 
digital platforms for online services, as well as projects to implement smart city strategies. And what we always saw was that coordination bodies spend a lot of energy to mobilize, continuously engage with a large number of partners. They have to cope with different interests, power imbalances, project risks. They need to develop a shared understanding, build trust among the different actors involved. So there's a lot of efforts needed to make um, intergovernmental collaboration um, working well and, 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 and run effectively. We also found clear variations in the progress of digital transformation, but also how collaboration is organized. Um, in all instances, however, and we had um, 10 case studies from five countries with saw efforts to build up a more centralized or to build up more centralized strategies and capacities to drive government digitalization. This somehow is what we would like to discuss with you today. This, of course, is easier in smaller, traditionally more centralized countries such as Estonia and Denmark and Great that we have representatives here with us, which tend to be ranked top with regard to digital public services, but also in Germany, my home country, um, which, with, with a much more decentralized governance structure. Um, this question of centralization is of high relevance. Um, the, the question, if you need a digital ministry to allow a more effective centralized steering of government digitalization has become really a hotly, fiercely discussed topic here in Germany throughout the last year. And that, that somehow, the extreme of centralization that you build up a centralized ministry. Um, I do not want to touch too much more about our research. I mean, we have many interesting insights about these factors to offer. Um, we have developed policy recommendations on how to achieve effective collaboration. Um, but I, however, do not want to bore you too much now with a detailed description of our research. You can find all this on our Tropical web page. And we really should make um, best use of our three fantastic panelists we have here today with us and their rich, impressive experiences on leading digital transformation in Denmark, in Estonia and Germany. And Lisa, I think you also shortly will introduce our panelists. Am I right? Yeah, fantastic and very happy um, to have Audrey joining the panel um, too yeah. from a Taiwanese from outside of Europe perspective. Um, so thanks, Audrey, for that. So what I wanted to do first um, is introduce you all, but not in the way that I think you're always introduced. Um, one of the things I love to do is humanize um, the bureaucrats by talking about um, who you really are. So I've asked you all to prepare um, something that's not in your professional bio that has shaped how or why you do this work, whether it's the digitalization work or whether it's why you're a public servant, just to sort of bring the, the human touch to all of this. So I'm going to start off with Marcus Richter. Marcus, give us give us a wave. Um, as I said before, he's the state secretary at the Federal Ministry of Interior, Buildings and Community um, and the CTO of Germany. So Marcus, what's something in your background that isn't so obvious reading your bio that shapes how you think about this? Well, I've been once in Nairobi, Kenya, and there I had the opportunity to work also at a slum project. And this was really touching for me. It was called, or it, it, it was called uh, um, Shoot Back. So kids from the slum uh, received a uh, camera and they had to take pictures of their surroundings. And then uh, they had the opportunity to participate in football games. Uh, so that's why it's called Shoot Back. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was so touching and moving that I thought uh, it, it would be great to contribute in a way um, to, to make life a little bit better. And I think that's what we are talking about here. You know, digitization is about creating or gaining data and to, to really implement data-driven processes and uh, to make decisions best, better. And this is something which still, yeah, moves me. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Marcus. It adds to the international approach. How can we learn from everyone and, and where do we get empathy and how do we bring that into government? So, Marcus, thank you for that. Shoot back um, from the slums um, of Nairobi to um, the CTO of Germany, bringing those perspectives in. Sim, I'm going to go to you. Um, as I mentioned, he um, is the CIO for the Estonian government in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications. Um, Sim, what's in your background? Well, I guess the thing I will point out is actually in my bio too. It's I'm Estonian, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but, but uh, by that I mean that look, we are 1.3 million people 
and that's what really has driven me to do stuff in government and to work on technology. We only have a few shots in this big bad world. And so if we really have to make the most of it, then you know we have to be good at our game. And that's what drives me. Mm. So the, the size of your country, right? The number of people that, and, and that are spread and you have rural areas and city areas and exactly. you were doing E early in Estonia, correct? Because of geography, is that right? <laughs> Exactly. And I mean, so I'm, I'm really from that generation who was the, who were the kids who were the first ones to be brought online back in the 90s, right? So we are the kids who now are unicorn founders and some of us in government. So, and, and we, we really grew up with this sort of mission saying, hey, technology could be the, the way that Estonia really can do something in the world. Yeah, great. So from, from public servants to unicorns, the kids that were brought online, um, <laughs> thanks him for, for joining. Um, we're going to go over to Denmark, or actually up to Denmark, up and over from where I'm at in Berlin, to Nina hosfeld Klassen. She's the head of division for Danish dig digitization. So what about your background, Nina? Um, well, it seems started out, out by saying he was Estonian, and uh, I should perhaps start off by saying that, yes, I'm Danish, but I'm actually a quarter Norwegian as well, and that has, uh, that has a, a, a great uh, impact on me and has had from an early childhood because I have been uh, going back and forth between Norway and Denmark, and uh, has increasingly seen digital solutions that are enabling um, our ownership of a small cottage in Norway and uh, enabling, you know, the cross country, cross barrier cooperation also between governments uh, in Denmark and Norway. And uh, that has, uh, I guess, opened my eyes for the great possibilities that comes from us not only co collaborating within national states, but also across national states, something that the Commission is also uh, increasingly working on using digital solutions and digital digitalization as an enabler for the collaboration uh, across national states. So that I guess that's very important for us going forward. Also enabling, you know, uh, work, for instance, between and, and, and travel and uh, doing business and studying uh, across national states within the European uh, community. Oh, fantastic, Nina. You, you made a lot of our colleagues from the University of Bergen, I think, very happy <laughs> knowing that you're a quarter um, Norwegian. But again, um, hitting on that topic of geography and identity and collaboration and, and how that all comes together. Audrey, how about you? What's, what's not in your bio that really drives how you think about this work? Well, I don't think I mentioned that I'm a middle school dropout, that I dropped out of high school when I was 15 years old. That was 1996, and I talked to the head of my school, not expecting she to um, agree to my position that uh, the textbooks were 10 years out of date, uh, and I'm able to correspond directly uh, to the researchers. But uh, much to my surprise, head of my school, Principal Du, said, okay, uh, it makes sense. From tomorrow, you don't have to go to my school anymore. So I may uh, drop out blessed, I guess, by the head of the school. Uh, and at the time, uh, there's no homeschooling act in Taiwan. So it really is an act of civil disobedience by a civil servant because she had to fake the records right, of me attending the school. So that's really imbued in me the sense that uh, maybe career public servants are actually the most innovative people. Wow, 15 dropout. I, my son's been saying the same things about his textbook, so I'm wondering what's coming next for him, Audrey. I'll, 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 I'll let you know. Gerhard, and last but not least, you. My personal pa. Mm, was not expecting this question. I thought I'm the chair of the moderator. Um, for me, I mean, it's really this engagement with the students over the last years. I mean, I always had the feel, I mean, my topic was really public making government better, but I increasingly realized, I mean, with digitalization, suddenly this topic of making government better and is becoming much more attractive for the young students. So five, 10 years ago, nobody of our students wanted to work for government, but now with this topic of government digitalization, suddenly government has become really attractive anymore uh, again. And, and many students want to work for government again. And I think that's, this change over the last five years was so impressive for me. And that was also the reason why we decided to have this Center for Digital Governments established. Fantastic, great, newly launched too. So let's get into the meet Gerhard. I'm gonna give you the first question um, 
to ask yeah. our panelists about the, their, their yeah, poll. Thanks answer. a lot, Lisa. I mean, you're so perfect moderating the whole thing, um, but I want to continue with a question to our panelists referring uh, to the findings of our first poll we had on the state of digitalization in your government today. And um, how did you answer this first poll question for yourself? So I, is your country a world leader, good, but need to go better or a long way to go? And we could see, I mean, the majority of our participants do see their governments not as world leader, but still um, um, progress or a long way to go. Um, I would like to start, I mean, um, Markus, I mean, Germany does not have the reputation for leading the world on government to digital transformation, but I know how much is going on. Would be great to have your insights on this question. Yeah, thank you. Well, actually, uh, it's clear that we have a long way to go. And yeah. actually, it will always be a long way because we will never be done uh, doing uh, digitization and modernization of governance. But we are now in a situation where we have to create more pressure to really make it happening. Uh, you know, there are so many decisions uh, which are coming up um, and we, we, are, we, we have to face it. All these decisions can't be made by just one profession like lawyers. You know, we, we, we have so complex systems, processes, it's very important that we do it in a more agile way to bring all these different professions together. Every decision on a business side has in the end an IT project, it brings an IT project with it, with it. And therefore it's important to bring all these different sides together from the very first. And I think we have to improve it. In, in Germany, and we've seen that is this in, in different crises now, um, uh, how uh, the pressure increases when we are not uh, doing this in this agile way. So um, from my point of view, it's clear we are having multiple stakeholders. From, from my point of view, digitization is not so much a point of IT, it's more a point of the business sides. They have to, uh, really have this in mind and I found it really interesting what Audrey mentioned yeah. um, the mindset is so important by doing all this and we have to create this mindset on the business side because they have to reflect their own processes they have to make yeah, uh, decisions and therefore um, it's clear we have this uh, multiple um, yeah, um, stakeholder approach, especially in Germany, where we have the federalism with the states, yeah. the lender, and uh, everyone is responsible for something. But in the end, it all has to fit together. And therefore, when I talk about a Ministry of Digitization, for instance, what we are thinking about uh, could be an idea. Um, it, it For me, it's not so important how it comes out or, or, or how... What if, if there is an own ministry or is it in the, in the chancellery or wherever, but we have to have a centralized steering. This is the important word, steering. It's not taking away the uh, competences of the different ministries and shift it just to one uh, organization. This would be a real mistake because they have to know it's their own uh, purpose and it's their own um, responsibility to make digitization happening. But it's great to have one centralized steering committee and to have a concrete action plan so that everyone knows who's responsible for what and when is time to deliver. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. I mean, this is really exactly the heart of what we have been doing in our tropical research. And um, Sim, may I pass over to you? I mean, we all know about Estonia, but maybe you have some new insights, um, what's going on and what the progress is in your country. Yeah, thank you. Well, I was about to say I'm, I'm nuts with the question, but I didn't. <laughs> but, uh, but I rather went for the, uh, the same thing that Marcus did, actually, saying that, look, we still have a long way to go in Estonia. Yeah. And, and the point is that, um, well, so we have been on a digitization journey and I say digitization journey, like transforming really public service and, and administration with technology for the last 20 years. Okay, we've done, you know, a fair bit. Um, so basically from user point of view, almost anything, any bureaucracy you need to do, you can do online yourself as a digital service option for that. But that doesn't mean it really means the user needs the best way. And, and we, I think we only scratched the surface there. So um, 
because what we fundamentally have done, and even though we've been transforming things along the way as well, our we still said even from user need we could do more because you know even if we just you know somehow make bureaucracy better and more smoother, the fundamental core public service in many ways is still you know not changed. Think about how we teach children in schools, even if we do it from remotely now, but fundamentally we still basically have a classroom mode in many ways. Or think about, you know, how doctors treat so patients in the hospital, even if they have all this sort of digital data and devices and tools and stuff available, fundamentally, it still very much happens in the old ways. So my point being that that's why I'm, I'm, I'm very humble in a sense saying, look, what we have achieved is stuff on the surface and it's been powerful change, but there's still so much more to do, especially as technology moves ahead. Your new frontiers come from that all the time. I mean, we all, um, you know, there's so much talk about artificial intelligence, for example. Again, we have only scratched the surface, even though we happen to be in Estonia front runner in this. So that's why I would like to be very practical and say that there's so much more to do. And, and I especially want to say that I think as was one last sort of note, like I think in the space, I wouldn't talk about world leadership at all, by the way. I would rather, I mean, that was, you know, one of the options in the question in the survey. Yeah. We are not in competition necessarily, although, you know, in some ways you can say the governments compete for talent and stuff. But fundamentally, what I always say to my team, at least, is say, our benchmark is not country next door. Our benchmark is our potential. And that's further wide ahead compared to what we have reached. Perfect, Sam. I mean, so impressive. I mean, recently touched very often this topic about humbleness. I mean, you should not be somehow kind of um, um, self-confident, but always try to become better, learn more. And I think that's really very nice to show in your answer. Um, Nina, very much interested to hear about Denmark on that. Yes, thank you very much. Well, uh, unlike Sim, I put uh, my uh, check mark in the world leader box. Um, that doesn't mean to say that I don't think we have a long way to go yet. We still have lots of potential. And in that way, I can I can quote Sim and, and, and declare that I'm totally uh, in agreement with what, what you said, Sim, about, you know, the benchmark not being other countries, but uh, the, the, possible, the possibilities ahead. That being said, I put the mark in the world leader because I think uh, not doing so would be a case of, you know, somehow false modesty on my side because we have been uh, in Denmark um, on, in several ben benchmarks. Uh, we have come out as uh, world leaders, uh, both by the UN and by the European Commission, been, been uh both European and world champions, so to speak, in digitization. But that being said, we have digitized our solutions uh, in both central and local government solutions, you know, from what meets the business needs, not necessarily what is best for the citizens. So in that respect, we have still a long way to go, uh, creating digital solutions that meet the citizens' needs and not just our needs from, from uh, different agencies. Yeah. In that respect, I think the Taiwanese example is uh, an, uh, very, <laughs> very inspirational for all of us and uh, the way to go for, for most of us. Um, I also would like to say, no, perhaps I should save that point for later when we come into the central, yeah. decentral discussion. But, um, we still have a long way to go, even though in some ways we can say, we, well, you know, in Denmark, everyone is a digital citizen uh, by definition, unless you are exempted, means everyone has a digital uh, ID, everyone has digital post box in, a, in which you can receive yeah. mail from uh, public authorities. So in that way, we are, of course, world leaders, but we, we have a lot of potential yet. Thanks a lot. And Andre, very much interested to hear about your, I mean, how do you see yourself in Taiwan? I mean, we are less familiar with what's going on in Taiwan than Denmark, Estonia. So very much interested to hear from you. Well, on the same benchmarks, we're very close to one another's, right? We also have broadband as a human rights, uh, digital competence in lifelong and basic education and so on, uh, with all the check marks checks. Uh, but I think uh, I checked uh, world leader, especially because uh, in Taiwan, we've really moved beyond this public servants versus the public thinking. Uh, we think public servants are part of the public. And for example, in 2017, when we redesigned one of our key infrastructure 
structured attacks filing experience. The breakout groups were facilitated by public servants from the Ocean Guard, right, from the Ocean Patrol. But when we redesigned the Ocean Portal, when it comes to surfing and amateur fishing, well, the breakout groups were facilitated maybe by the participation offices of Ministry of Taxation and Finance and so on. And the idea very simply, is that uh, the Sea Patrol is also someone who files their own tax, uh, and the financial office is also someone that serves uh, in their spare time. So by making sure that they take the side of the demand side, the citizens, uh, we don't have this dichotomy between the public servants in a silo, but rather they work actively across the silos. Perfect, thank you. Lisa, I pass over to you for the next question. Thank you. I see we have a bit of shy participants on the on the chat. So I'm going to ask if people can just up to now in this sort of great opening um, where we talked about how um, each of those folks saw their governments. Put your one word takeaway. We had some great, great sort of insights on um, humility or benchmark being our potential or um, lots of things. We will just put, take a minute to put in one word so we can get you engaged in this. And it's a good feedback for us to get a sense of what you're thinking. So go ahead and get that started. So I'm going to bridge you all um, to the second poll question that we had, which is this um, centralization versus not centralization um, question, which I know some of you are probably tired of hearing as well, but it is it is a really live conversation in many governments who are trying to deal with this. Um, so I'm going to first go um, to you, I'll go back to you, Nina. I'll let you start because it seems like you've got something brewing in this question of centralization versus not centralization. Like, what's the way to go? What have you learned on this journey? Um, I don't know if I can say there's one way to go, but uh, from our experience, I think actually, even though it, it struck me that Gerhard, you mentioned that Denmark was a centralized country. In our own point of view, we are a very de de decentralized country. Um, we do have one central government. We don't have states as Olenda, as you do in, in, in Germany, Marcus, but we have a very decentralized public sector, meaning that we have 98 municipalities and five regions who all have their own uh, responsibilities when it comes to public digitiz digitization. Uh, what we do have as a central responsibility is the coordination of the processes that lead us to agree upon national strategies for digitiz digitalization. We have a long tradition for coordinating and collaborating on the digital strategies. We don't have, you know, government, central government strategies. We have joint government strategies uh, crossing both uh, yeah. or encompassing both central government level, regional level and municipal level. And seeing that we have 98 municipalities who all need to somehow find a common strategy, it's very vital that, you know, the, the agreements that we reach upon how on, on the national strategies, the joint public sector strategies that you know, that, that we are all aboard on these agreements, that somehow we have joint ownership ship to the strategies in order for us to have the most effective and most uh, locally based implementation of the strategies, because that is local government responsibility to implement the strategies. And the central government uh, responsibility in that, that respect is, you know, to set up the processes that lead us to agree upon these strategies. Then, of course, we have some matters of uh, of lawmaking also. For instance, on the digital post, that was made mandatory by law, but it was made mandatory after that we had, after we had, you know, agreed upon between levels of government uh, that this was the way to go forward. This was the next big step in order to enable effective digitalization and also user-friendly digitalization, because what we have seen is that Danes actually love their national EID and they love the self-service solutions and they love and welcome the possibilities that it gives them. But it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been as effective in our, you know, in our own point of view, very decentralized country, if not, if we had not had the joint ownership of the strategy. Yeah. 
Super. Audrey, I'm going to go to you. I'm, I'm struck, Nina, about this sort of fe the federal and local and implementation and bringing that together, which is so important. I mean, Marcus talked a bit about that being the, the challenge and perhaps the opportunity that's that's faced in Germany. But Audrey, over to you on centralized versus non-centralized. Your thoughts, lessons. Definitely. definitely. Uh, I, I checked the uh, uh, wrong question uh, pick, and, and that's because uh, just exactly as Nina uh, has shared, in Taiwan, we focus not immediately on the rules and regulations, which is the main crux of decentralization versus centralization, but we focus on what, what's the norm, what, what's considered normal, uh, what should be the social expectation of our digital services. Uh, and so, for example, when we talk about the norms around uh, ride sharing, right? Uber X and so on. The KPIs are literally crowdsourced. I, I introduced the police conversation. So each and everyone, regardless of their level in the government, whether they're a taxi driver or a passenger, can say what is the one thing that's important to them. And through agree and disagree, we get into the measurement of uh, progress. And then I think it's about mutual accountability. It became then very apparent uh, what is the kind of regulatory work that a local temple or church should do if they want to start a ride sharing campaign or what is the role of the central government and also of the private sector. So I call this the people-public-private partnership. The people, the social sector, uh, agree on norms and habits. The public sector amplify that into rules and regulations. And then the private sector works in a very decentralized market-driven layer. Thanks for that very concrete um, example. Um, I'm thinking about that in the German context, Marcus, um, about, about a system like that. Um, it, it, will it take a centralized or decentralized approach to, to do some of that in, in Germany and what's your thinking? You talked a little bit about this before, about the guidance work, but other thoughts about this. It's a real issue here we're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. From my point of view, as I said, it's important to involve the business sides. This is something we have to do in a decentralized way. But it's still important to have a common ground, to have a, have a common platforms, for instance. Um, and we need a centralized architecture board, uh, you know, where, where we have architecture guidelines and where we can also prove them if they are met uh, by the states within Germany, for instance. And I think it's great that we have contracts between the federal level and the states. And we committed all to the goal to digitize all public services by the end of next year, which is pretty soon. And uh, which uh, leads to a lot of pr pressure now to everyone. Uh, also within the 11,400 communities and cities uh, in, in Germany because they are also committed to this goal. And it's important that they are not just running uh, in some direction and in the end nothing fits together anymore. It's important that we have um, a common sense how to do it because we only will be successful if we have a guideline like one is creating a solution and puts this solution also in production and the others can join and use it. So that's why we um, have now all our different um, fields like um, housing or um, um, yeah, hobbies, you know, all these different services uh, of public administrations are divided into these different fields and each state within Germany is responsible for one field to digitize this one and the others can use then the solution which are coming up. And I totally agree also with Nina. It's really a question on how to organize, how to make visible. And I found it really interesting when I was to Paris um, also to see what they are doing. They put all their governmental goals on a roadmap and um, combined it also with KPIs yeah. and made visible in which department, um, department, um, um, how, how far are they? And uh, in, in the first step, all these different stakeholders were pretty nervous and maybe not so convinced that this is the right way because no one wanted to have the red, uh, um, um, how do you say, uh, <laughs> A flag in the end um, and uh, yeah and uh, but but now there's a constructive discussion why is this working in this deep department 
but not in the other one. And I think it's also great to see that the minister there um, goes every Friday to another department and asks, where are you standing? And uh, I think this is more transparency to governmental work. And I think it's important if we don't want to lose the uh, acceptance by people, we have to be more transparent and to make visible where we are standing, where are good solutions mm -hmm. and where are also things which don't work out and where we want participation of people and users uh, to ask, what can we do to make it better? And this is something which is a bit new to governmental work in Germany because everyone is afraid of doing mistakes. And I think we have not only to change the public sector itself, but we have also to improve the, the public discussion about failure and learning and uh, being faster. This is something we have to debate in a public um, level, in a public level. Super, thank you, Marcus, for that. Um, living in Germany, I can feel that that debate is beginning to happen. It's live, right? We're living in it. Yeah. Um, Sam, I'm gonna go to you, and unless you have something groundbreaking you want to say and centralized versus not. There's a question here I'd love to get to the audience um, directed at you that says you're you're moving fast forward with digitalizing or digitizing. Um, they're different, but pu the public sector, how do you bridge the digital divide and avoid exclusion? A question above um, uh, someone else asked the same sort of question. What has your been experience about including everyone in digitization? I'll be happy to take that up, but let me just say just two things before that on the central and, and or decentralized stuff, right? Um, so we have to understand two things here. First of all, is that um, if we talk about so-called business side of things, right? Look, if the rest of government is not getting more decentralized or centralized, you basically have to tune what you do digitally to that. Digital stuff is a tool, right? So, so and that's my point sort of being that at least that's sort of what I see around the world is that so if the government fundamentally is decentralized, there's no way you can bring too much centralization in, right? Because it's just not going to happen, right? So you have to find ways of effective mechanisms and tools how to somehow stay on the same page. And that's essentially what we're talking about here. And that's why I love the sort of the wording um, you had for the question, which is about steering. Now, steering can only be centralized. There only can be one captain basically in a boat <laughs> or, you know, in a plane, car, whatever. So, and, and that's my whole point. So, so that's the sort of balancing act we do. And so a lot of Estonian experience has been how to find that sort of uh, middle way and hybrid the way in a way. So we started from, you know, really top down. And that the issue was that then basically you were only delivering as much as there was a bandwidth of one team and it was nowhere near in touch with the mm -hmm. users in all different areas. Then you, we decentralized the whole other way. Everybody was responsible for their stuff only. And everybody was running in two different directions and, and very uneven experience or, or quality of services. So okay. we've been clawing that back now. So, and that's my sort of point saying in terms of steering, I think fundamentally all of us, you know, a different context are looking for effective ways for two things to steer how everybody stays on the same page in terms of where are we going? What's the next level? And that a certain amount or a certain minimum level of services is guaranteed all over the place. So how do you lift all the boats to that? That's what is the architectural guidance, you know, what Marcus mentioned. That's why we do platforms. That's why you do like, yeah. you know, skilling. I mean, all that sort of stuff. So I just want to bring that in that to fundamentally say that, look, it's, I think actually that the space for discussion is much more confined to the, what are the tools, not the models necessarily. In terms of digital divide, two cents there. Well, first of all, from Estonian experience, um, from very early days of our digital journey, I mean, the, the skilling and connectivity haven't been part of the strategy because of that. Just to make sure that, you know, the more we do stuff digitally in government, for example, or in the whole of country, the more there's also ability for people to use the stuff as well. And so, uh, but we didn't, you know, wait for the users to pop up, but we rather started exactly doing offering of services in parallel already. Secondly, the digital divide thing, I want to just really throw it out there is that to say that even if there's some people not online yet, that does not mean that we should be doing more and better in terms of digital in government for, for public service delivery. So even if not everybody is able to use it yet, but if let's say 80% are, there's no way we should be holding those 80% back. So, and, and this is what I think gets lost in a divide mm -hmm. quite a bit saying, hey, so what about 10 or 20 or whatever percent of people who are not online? Yeah, you still have to serve them too, but that doesn't mean we have to be crappy for the rest. 
That's the quote. That doesn't mean we have to be crappy for the rest, Asim, on the digital divide. Um, so Gerhard, we have one last question in a speed round. Do you, you want to deliver to our, this is about exactly what you're talking about, Sim. You bridge to the role of skills and mindset. So Gerhard, you want to do a speed round with our panelists and we'll close up. Wonderful. Now, that's indeed a question, um, a topic which already came up um, through some of the comments, Audrey, um, Marcus, and, and the others. Um, we want to expand a little bit the discussion. I mean, effective implementation of digitalization is not only about structure, steering, like we talked today um, already, but also about skills of the leaders, the employees. And my question, and I would ask for a very short answer, which in your opinion is the most important skill or competency needed for government digitalization and why? Um, so that's what we would like to address to our speakers. I mean, not an easy question, but you reduce it to one. Audrey, may I start with you? Uh, certainly is to trust our citizens because oh. to give no trust is to get no trust. Perfect answer, thanks a lot. Nina. Sorry, yeah, that's difficult to, to follow tweet, but I would say that the most important, other than that, which I'm totally, uh, which I totally agree with, other than that, I would say that the most important quality actually is uh, to be able to, to listen and col collaborate um, and not just do what you think is right, but actually listen to both, both the users, uh, but also other agencies, other authorities, uh, and also private vendors and suppliers. So listening and collaboration skills, in my point of view, are vital to successful, successful digitization. Thanks a lot. Markus. Well, from my point of view, the most important skill is that even in changing times, in unsecure situations, you should be able to see it as a chance. And this is a skill which is not only needed in the field of digitization, it's needed in every single situation where decisions should be made. Thanks a lot. And Sim? Yeah, so I've been talking to you know, colleagues and peers over the last few months, dozens of them, right, around this topic, and they always bring up one thing, and I would say the same, is basically how to lead and organize for delivery. Whatever that means, it's not a digital issue at all. It's pure just ABC of management. So how do you get the teams yeah. to deliver? We all have great ideas. We get, we have the technology and stuff, but to really sort of you know make the fruit come out of that, that's the that's the nutshell here. So uh, perhaps not answering you what you expected, but but that's the heart of it. Yeah. Thanks Gerhard, so if I if I could jump in on that, Sim, you know, apolitical, we we are a collaborative learning platform for people in government. And when we first started off, we thought, oh, people are going to need to know uh, digitization and all these sort of policies. And by far, the most important, uh, the most popular, and they say to us, the most important is how do I communicate effectively? How do I run a meeting? How do I write a memo? How do I manage to inspire people? These really human, I heard all of you talk about these very human skills, trusting and listening and managing and looking for opportunity, even when things are really hard. So that definitely, um, definitely uh, squares with our experience when you actually really listen to the public service. And Audrey, I was really struck by just wanting to keep bringing this back. I, I have a bias towards loving bureaucrats. Um, I'm a former one um, myself, but also just really, really thinking about the, the role and the possibility and, and, and seeing public servants as citizens um, as well, I think will go a long way um, in all of our countries to, to better delivery. So we have five minutes um, before we want to wrap up. Does anyone have a burning question that you want to come off mute to ask? If not, nope, Maximilian was thinking about it. I could see it. I'll, I'll ask, I'll ask um, a, a question and whichever one of these panelists wants to answer, you can. So yeah. we're, we're back, Gerhard, at a reunion in 10 years. We're all here. We've, we're back, maybe a little grayer, uh, maybe a little wiser. Um, hopefully we've had fun and have been fair um, along the way, um, Audrey. What are we talking about in 10 years? What's going to be the topic in digital era collaboration 10 years from now? What do you think we'll be talking about today? Marcus, yep. yeah. Well, for, 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 from my point of view, it's really about the question, how do we governance worldwide in an international context? So if we 
let's take uh, electronic ID. Uh, I think it's great that we create something like this in Europe, but it should be made worldwide. And it's important to have e-collaboration in a way, yeah, that we can work together um, free from too much lock-in effects and having open source more in it, you know, to create really um, offers to the people which they can use also in an international context. Great. Um, 10 years from now, we'll be talking about that. Sim? Yeah, so I think what I've seen from experience is we, it's hard to know what we will be talking about because stuff will change. But let me, I thought about it this way. So I know what I don't want to be talking about. <laughs> and that's what should inform us. I mean, if in 10 years we are still talking about, you know, how to have a digital mindset, you know, how to have the proper sort of you know, skills and sort of, you know, be user-centric and agile, then we have failed. And I think, you know, if we get these blocks right fun finally, because we were talking about them 10 years ago as well. So if we get those right finally, then we can actually have other stuff that we should be talking about. That's great. What we shouldn't be talking about in 10 years. Nina? I think it's very difficult to know what we're going to be talking about. Uh, looking back to 10, 10 years ago, we launched our fourth national strategy on digitization in Denmark. It was a four-year strategy. It didn't take into account the development towards using uh, mobile screens, and mobile platforms. So we had to adjust the strategy in just uh, after just two years, I think. Um, so technology happens fast, change happens fast. One thing I do think that we will still be talking about because it's an ever going important subject is citizens trust in government, which is, of course, uh, affected by our increasing use of technology in and, and data sharing and uh, artificial intelligence. So how to, to maintain trust in government, I think will be an ongoing discussion many years to come. That's a great setup, Audrey. What were we going to be talking about in 10 years? Any thoughts from your perspective in a quick quick bite? Yeah, definitely. Uh, because part of my job description says, uh, when we see Internet of Things, let's make it Internet of Beings. And also, whenever we hear singularity is near, let's make sure that the plurality stays here. So I guess we'll be talking about how to include non-humankind uh, sapient um, ideas uh, into our planetary governance and also future generations who by default doesn't have a vote, but maybe by that time will be able to include some proxy of their interests in our democratic governance. That's kind of a mic drop moment for the future, right? Um, thank you, Audrey. Um, Gerhard, any last words from you while, until I wrap us up? I mean, on this question, I think, I mean, I'm now doing research 25 years on the topic of public sector reform, and I see a lot of continuity. So I think the technologies, what we will talk in 10 years, will be changing rapidly, but I think it will be some core topics we will still continue to discuss, as we have discussed before, how do we better collaborate, how do we better engage with citizens, how do we better deliver. So I think these questions, what kind of skills, competences we need, we we'll still will discuss in 10 years. So there will be some kind of stability also in what we will discuss in the future. Um, Gerhard, I fully agree with you. Uh, I wanted to say more or less the same thing. Uh, one thing more that I think that we will be discussing about is infrastructure to implement all these technologies. Because yes, on the one hand, we have technology that is uh, advancing and changing very rapidly and administrations have to um, uh, uh, to reconsider their approach based on uh, the new conditions. But on the other hand, we have society and uh, they will still have the same problems, like um, uh, how to improve their skills, how to get access and so on and so forth. And we will also have the discussion on infrastructure because smart city infrastructure is costly we have many legacy infrastructures in place that need to be replaced. And again, uh, the, the entire issue of upgrading urban infrastructure in order to enable uh, smart city uh, services uh, will still be an issue. Thanks, That's Margarita, something. for that. Thank you. So great, Gerhard. I'm going to ask everyone to turn on their cameras as I thank Audrey and Marcus and Gerhard and Nina and Sim and all of you. Um, if you could, as you're turning your cameras, put your one word takeaway. What's the one feeling or thought 
I'm always struck by the personal leadership that I need to work on myself. So much of what we're talking about is going and really showing up as people and continuing our human skills um, with one another. Um, I want to, while you're getting ready to wave it, anyone just remind, we have um, a second session for this final tropical report involving citizens in policy design today at two. And then tomorrow I'll be back for one on involving the private sector and the process of public service innovation. So with that, thank you everyone for joining. Let's give everyone a wave if you wanna come off Mute, you can say uh, goodbye in your own language. We have people from Italy and Israel and everywhere, Taiwan. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day and thanks for everything you do. Yeah, take care. Bye.